Okay, so so we'll get started today. Um, just to, to <coughs> sort of let you know how this how this happened today. Um, what I came to the Berkman Center to do was to kind of function as an intermediary between a number of different worlds. So I'm a full-time touring musician and have been for a long time, but I also have a little foot in the activism world and a foot in the tech policy world and a, um, a foot here at the Berkman Center and trying to, to connect all these worlds around this idea of how to make a sustainable living for artists. Um, one of the organizations that I've worked with for a long time is a group called the Future Music Coalition, which was founded 10 plus years ago. Um, and what we are is a national nonprofit that advocates for musicians in the policy space, mm -hmm. essentially. And um, I'm on the board, and one of my fellow board members is our guest today, Kristen Thompson. And um, if you listen to All Things Considered yesterday, there was a really nice kind of overview of a project that Future Music is going public with right now, which is an artist revenue survey. And um, yesterday's NPR piece was a nice overview of it. But what Kristen and her co-survey um, director, director yeah. Jean Cook, are doing are having different data releases around, dif around different ideas. And so we're lucky enough to have Kristen today premiering a <laughs> data release about um, the teams that artists put together and sort of how that is changing and interacting with the current music business. Um, all I can say about Kristen is she's amazing, and um, <laughs> educator, activist, organizer, and um, presenter today. Well, thank you Kristen very much. Thompson. Thanks so much. Um, so Aaron covered a lot in the sort of intro, so I'll sort of dive in. And Aaron and I um, have had conversation the, recently about what to cover today, and because there is a lot of data in the Artist Revenue Streams project, um, as a sort of preface for this, the reason that we did the Artist Revenue Streams project is that, you know, clearly, uh, everyone in this room knows that there's been this vast change in the musical landscape for artists in the past 10 to 12 years, especially. Um, there's so many new technologies and services available to artists to help them create and promote and distribute their music. Um, there's assumptions made that, you know, that this has clearly broken down barriers to the entry points, the access to the marketplace. but. For us, the question has been, how have these, all these changes affected their ability to make a living? How have they affected their revenue streams? And so the really, um, this is the point of the Artist Revenue Streams project. Um, we have quite a few slides today, but a lot of them are just sort of um, decoration. <laughs> um, uh, because um, we have so much data, and we want to sort of be able to present some of the stuff visually. Um, and so we'll run through quite a few. But please interrupt us at any time. Please stop the conversation or whatever I'm saying to ask us a question or a clarifying point, because we really should have a dialogue about this instead of me just presenting. So, um, so we are the question that sort of we're trying to discover through this project is how musicians are uh, generating revenue based on their creative work. And um, you know, it's funny to think about why we need to do this work because all of us are bombarded with data points every day, and the music industry has tech has for many years been kind of drowning in data. There's billboard charts, and there's Nielsen data, and there's SoundScan data. But um, this research isn't trying to understand, say, the label's leverage power or the social graph of artists or whatever. It's, it's not about consumer spending or anything like that. It's about measuring um, individual musicians' earning capacity. And so it's a benchmarking effort, too, because this is kind of the first time we've ever tried to do something like this, especially cross-genre and amongst all the disciplines. For us, that means composers, recording artists, performers, session musicians, teachers, and people who make money off their brand. So um, it's about how much money they end up putting in their pocket and how it's changing over time. And the, really, the only way you can figure this out is by asking musicians directly. So the, the methodology we've been using is a triple one. Um, we've been doing in-person interviews. We did about 80 in the past year and a half, and they cover everything from the composer who doesn't perform to the performer who doesn't compose, and everybody in between. Nashville songwriters, um, you know, hip-hop DJs, everything like that. We also did some financial case studies. Those are also available online, really interesting. We've done five so far, and we probably have four or five more to go. And we did this big online survey last fall. And um, as you'll see through, through some data we can present today, there's, there's a lot that you can learn from this survey. Um, about over 5,300 musicians and composers 
completed the survey, so we have a lot to work with. So uh, we're just going to touch on some stuff today, but there is a website that holds all of our results and a lot more about the methodology of the project. Um, it's at money.futuremusic.org. One of the things that people sometimes um, know us for is this um, list of 42 revenue streams. Um, we won't go through it in detail today, but it is available on the website, and it itemizes all of the possible revenue streams for US-based musicians um, based on the sort of contours of copyright law and business practice. And if anyone sees anything missing, please let us know. <laughs> um, so, so for today's talk, Aaron and I thought we would sort of dive into one of the sort of romantic notions about how technology is impacting musicians' um, ability to make a living, and that's whether musicians can do it all themselves. Um, and is it true? Can a musician do it all themselves? Can they play all the roles? Can they do all the business transactions that it need, you need to do in order to make everything work? And so we're going to refer to some data from our survey, from the music, Money for Music survey, but also our personal experience and as musicians and community members. I can't believe I forgot to say what a great musician you are. <laughs> I, I pale in comparison to her guitar playing. Um, but I was part of her Christmas choir. That's right. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so anti-Christmas choir. Um, so before we wade into sort of the survey data, we wanted to give you a sense of the different roles that musicians play. Some of this might be really um, elementary for some of you who understand this one, but we'll, we'll do it anyway. So think of music creators in three big buckets for today. We have people who are composers and songwriters, or songwriters, people who are recording artists, and people who are performers. So many musicians play all these roles simultaneously. Um, so if I write my own songs, and then I record those songs, and then I play them live, I'm doing all three. Aaron, is that you? That's you. But as a reminder, in, the, in this research, we thought of these roles separately. And we also interviewed and talked to and thought about session, session players separately and teachers separately, because they all have slightly different access to revenue streams. Um, so it's because US copyright law and the contours and the business practices treat these roles differently that we're going to talk about them a little bit separately today because there are revenue streams available to uh, songwriters that are not available to recording artists. The one that st sticks out we should probably mention is the public performance right, which if your music gets played on the radio, the composer earns a royalty, but the person who performed it, or the recording artist who sang it, does not. So it's important to think of the distinctions. So what do these creator types need to propel their music career forward? In the most basic sense, the composer needs to, somebody to help them license their compositions. The recording artist needs somebody to help them record and distribute that recorded music. And the performer needs someone to help them organize and get paid to play shows. Let's look at each separately for a second. So the composer, they write music. They want compositions to be licensed for use. Um, this means they need to make connections with recording artists that might perform their work, record labels, producers, TV people that might license their work. This is frequently done by a, pu by a publisher. So the publisher acts as a liaison. They shop the songs around. They help get them placed. They deal with licensing fees and negotiations and paperwork and compensation. And for this work, the publishing company gets 50% of the writer's share of licensing deals or compositions based on that, those royalty streams. Do you want to jump in and say anything about publishers right now, Aaron? Um. No, not just to add, we were talking about what what it do, what does a publisher do, right? So they might, yes, get your song plates. And I was just thinking they get other singers to sing your songs, yeah. too, you know? Yeah, so that's, what I would add that's right sort of now. the traditional role of a publisher. Yep. Hey, I have this composition. Maybe Madonna wants to sing it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. Yeah, I hope so. So, um, so the question in this sort of current landscape, can composers and songwriters self-publish? Do you need a publisher? And of course, yes, you can self-publish. There's many, many artists that are self represent, or represent themselves in publishing. Um, they, choose, they choose to retain control, or perhaps there's no publisher that wants to publish them. That's OK. But so what are the challenges of self-publishing? Someone has to be the point person uh, if there's requests for your stuff to be licensed. You also probably just don't have the same amount of leverage as a publisher who can dedicate time to finding places for your stuff to be 
used. But, you know, if this is a choice, it's fine. Um, you get to keep 100% of the publishing money that might come through that if you're, if you're self-published. So um, let's look at recording artists. So these are musicians who go into the studio and they record compositions or songs. Now these might be songs that they wrote or they might be songs that someone else wrote. You can see why talking about the role separately matters. Um, but they end up with a sound recording that's um, songs affixed to tape or a hard drive. And how do they get them from the studio into the hands of fans? So traditionally, this has been the job of the record label. Um, they take the sound recording and they manufacture it onto whatever media is popular at the mo moment. Vinyl, 8-track, an 11-inch like Jack White put out. Right. Um, by balloon. <laughs> by balloon. And then they distribute it to retailers. Um, for this, they get a hefty chunk of the wholesale price and 50% of any deals that are the licensing on the sound recording. But that's not all that record labels do. Um, traditionally, they have, in many instances, they're a source of cash to tour or record. They write big checks so the artists can get into nice studios and hire producers. Labels also give recording artists access to producers, to studios, booking agents, publicists. The record labels also have staff to deal with the boring stuff like accounting and promo mailings. Um, they also have PR muscle. They are able to get music played on commercial radio, which is incredibly influential. And they can get stuff um, reviewed in big records, uh, big, big, uh, big media publications. And if you're label list, some of this stuff is really, really hard to do. <laughs> it's really hard to get on commercial radio without of label. <laughs> um, but also, our, hardly ever mentioned is legitimacy, because a label deal means that somebody trust, somebody thinks you're good enough to offer you a deal. And this is a green flag for other people in the music industry. It makes it easier to get a booking agent. It makes it easy, it raises your profile. It makes it possible to get bigger shows, make more money with guarantees, and it gets you more prominent management, um, which are all tied into revenue. It's clear, as we'll see. Um, but the trade-offs with signing label deals, some of them are very well understood or talked about a lot. You almost always have to transfer your copyrights to the record label. Um, there may be upfront payments for you striking a deal with a label, for example, in advance. But oftentimes, you don't see any money after that because it's hard to recoup and make money on the royalty side of things. Yeah? Um, I just want to like I do think that pe there's a, a growing idea that like you don't need a label and there is there is this idea that it's totally legit to be on your own it's a story that's certainly happening we can think of artists that that that's true for I actually still feel like in the general music industry and especially in the ways that Kristen's talking about in terms of like leveraging different roles and having multiple roles and working with established parts of the music industry it still matters yeah I don't want it to but i I think it still does. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the other thing uh, worth mentioning is sort of the loss of control. And we don't mean like control in the biggest sense, but also just like you're often on someone else's schedule. And there's a lot more people that have to agree to something for it to happen. You're not completely in control of your sound recordings and what happens with them. So there's those trade offs. Well, can the same question, can musicians record and release their own music? Yes, it happens all the time. And in fact, it's a lot easier now than even 10, 12 years ago. There are now music services like CD Baby and TuneCore, um, Pledge Music, that um, help artists really um, get through some of this, the sort of mechanical parts of things. It's very easy to get music into the big stores like iTunes or Amazon through these intermediaries that make it very affordable and really easy to do. Um, the process, the sort of mechanical parts of it, making records and getting it very demystified now and quite simple for most musicians to participate in. But what are the trade-offs with doing it yourself? You have a long list of things you are responsible for. Promotion, manufacturing, physical and digital distribution if you choose to do physical. Um, and so either that's yourself doing the work or it's perhaps it's you have a manager, perhaps you have to deal with distributors, you might have to hire a publicist, you might need a web designer, and there's this bottom thing, someone has to pay for it. Um, 
luckily, this is another place where there's a lot more options. You know, in prior years, if you didn't have a label, maybe you went and got a loan from somebody. But now there's a lot of alternative um, funding sources. Kickstarter, Pledge Music, other sort of crowdfunded options. You can strike some partnership deal with other labels. You could go for sponsorship. Um, you could um, ask your parents. You could use credit cards. Um, right? All of those things happen, and probably in bits and pieces too, right, Erin? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, we, before we were talking, we also heard somebody talk about thinking about this funding question, which I'd like to return to at the end yep. as something to, to talk more about as like a venture capital question. It's also yep. like a way to think about it. Yep. There's a lot of parallels between the music industry and the venture capital industry. Is there? Yeah. Uh, for example, the percentage of companies that succeed, the upfront payments, the lack of, uh, and, and so the outcome and the control of outcome. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we'll just move on to our last little role profile performers. Um, this one's the most, the most clear cut. It's probably the easiest to understand just because the, the thing that performers need is just connections to venues and festivals and other places where they can perform. It sounds easy, um, but if anyone's tried to book a show here, <laughs> it's uh, let alone arrange a string of shows for a tour, it's not that easy. Um, so usually performers and bands get a booking agent um, who helps them get shows and the agent negotiates how much they get paid and, um, the, and uh, the ticket price and the size of the venue. And if the band is going out on tour, they try and string the shows together so you're not driving 600 miles between shows. Um, and for their work, they get about 10 to 15% of tour gross. Can bands book their own shows? Yes, they can. But the, the hard part is just, the, the the challenges are that you have to sort of fit your world into the booking into the venue promoters world, calling to arrange the dates on their office hours, um, you know, making this work, um, and sort of keeping track of all the details. But also, you just lack the leverage that a booking agent has. A booking agent with a big roster can leverage certain bands against others. They can. They also have green flags in the music world, like a very high profile booking agent means you're just going to get more money because of who that person is. So these are all sort of all these people we've talked about, all these teammates and, and partners actually do have an impact on how much musicians make. So we've described the three essential teams. Um, a composer or songwriter needs a publisher or some way to license their compositions. A recording artist needs a label or some way to distribute their music. A booking agent needs, I mean, a performer needs a booking agent or some way to arrange shows. But there's other roles that we haven't even talked about yet up top. Whether you, whatever role you play or if you play all three, you might need a manager to keep track of everything. You might need an attorney to look at contracts to negotiate relationships and partnerships. You might need an accountant because all those details are quite um, overwhelming at times. If you are a recording artist or a performer, you probably you might need a publicist at some point to help you promote a release or a tour. You might need somebody to help with web building, web design. You might need a graphic designer to help with album art. You might need a photographer. You might need a videographer. Then, if you're a performer, there's even more people that might be involved. You, you probably have bandmates who are on tour with you, whether they're part of a partnership or hired guns that you pay as sort of session players. You might have a tour manager to help you keep things organized on tour. You might have a sound person. You might have road crew. And if you're really big, you might have a bus driver. You might have a merch person. You might have a lighting director. You know, like there's a lot of people potentially involved in this sort of team framework. Um, yeah, but the promoter would never work for a particular artist. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Sure. Yeah. So it's really hard for composers to make money on merchandise, but but recording artists and performers certainly, the merchandising side is enormous. Well, it can be big, but when we did our survey, it was like a range of two to six percent of 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 all the sort of aggregated amount of money that um, all of our survey respondents said they made was only about between 2 and 6%, depending on what they played, was uh, based on merchandise. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Madonna or Lady Gaga. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm sure that Madonna's merch percent, amount of money that comes from her brand is much bigger than your average artist, but it, again, is very contextual based on what you do. So, um, yeah, so let's look at a couple of case studies. One of them is the band, <laughs> one of the band, was, this is the band I was in in the, um, in the 90s. So we were very do-it-yourself. We, um, we put out our own records, and we put out band, uh, records of other bands we liked. Um, we had a booking agent, which was critical. That, that was really important for us, and I don't think we could have booked our own shows after a certain point. We didn't have a manager. We didn't have a tour manager. We had an attorney when we needed one. We had an accountant for taxes. We never took road crew out. We always sort of moved our own gear. We always did our own merchandise. Um, no internet, no webmaster, because we didn't have a website. <laughs> and um, we used a publicist once in a while. Um, we did have a sort of a umbrella um, manufacturing and distribution deal with a bigger record label that had a Chicago office and a London office that helped us um, get stuff more globally released and distributed into more retailers, which was very helpful. But it was a um, sort of a contract deal. Like, we didn't sign away any rights for that to happen. So, and then I thought Erin um, was, was willing to show what her team looks like. So maybe you can talk about that. Yeah. Um, so so um, I think it's interesting that Kristen mentioned like pre pre internet. I'm certainly post internet. My first record came out in 1999, and um, I've always always had a website. Um, so for me, for publishing, uh, my publishing has always felt too valuable for me. For any, I have had a publishing offers, but it's never felt like enough money to me to give it away. Um, but I do have an overseas publishing administrator, and basically what they do for a percentage of my royalties, they collect them. This is a longer, thornier question of why I'm not just paid what's owed to me by overseas companies, but in general, you aren't, and you do have to hire someone to go out and get that money for you, and they do it for a percentage. I do get some other auxiliary things from working with that person. I have um, the lawyer that I work with, attorney when necessary, um, comes through my overseas publishing administrator and that's been completely valuable and the lawyer that I work with works on contingency so that's also kind of incredible um, record label right now himself I have as I said with indie major label history I'm at an interesting point right now this talk is basically my life and um, I'm, I have a record that's finished I'm trying to figure out how to put it out right now and so all of these questions that are coming up are, are real life questions for me I have a booking agent um, I I would say they are possibly the piece of my team I cannot lose. They are the piece of my team I cannot lose. As Kristen was saying, like I could do that work, but I think it's probably the hardest of all these things we're talking about for the artists to do themselves for a number of reasons. So um, manager, no, self-managed right now. I have had that relationship um, in the past. It's been helpful. It's also it's a trade-off like any of these other things we're talking about. So I've enjoyed being self-managed the last couple of years. Again, I'm at this point where I need to con reconsider that. Um, accountant, yes. I have a full-time business manager who works for a small percentage of my tour gross. And um, I also would, that would be sort of next to booking agent, someone that I couldn't lose. Absolutely couldn't lose. Um, I travel a ton and my business manager actually like make sure that you know my credit cards get paid and my car insurance gets paid. It's not that I'm not capable of doing that. I do not want to feed this idea of artists not being capable of running their own life. I hate that trope, but, um, but it's very helpful for me. Um, I have always had band mates as sidemen. I have never had a equitable partnership in band mates, and I actually have preferred that for creative reasons. Actually, it's been really nice to, I play a lot of different kinds of music, and it's been really nice to, as I go through different phases or different records, to be able to bring in people who have different skill sets and have a kind of a band that can have a changing sound. Um, and so, just to clarify, that means you invite people to come on tour with you, and then they get paid a certain amount of money for that service. Yeah, they, and I usually do it by the week, but um, other artists will do it by the show, you can do it by the tour, people, people do that all the time. But um, in general, I'm mean, going to have some players that I've worked with for probably five or six years off and on, and that seems to be in the overlaps, and then I might call someone that 10 years ago I did a gig with because I know they're good at this 
the certain kind of music that I want to do. And it's the same thing for me in recording as well. Same thing when I pick people to come with me in the studio who aren't necessarily the people that are with me on the road. That's against the creative choice. Um, no road crew, um, house sound person. I have at times combined the role of tour manager, sound person, road crew, merch. There's a sort of breed of crazy alien human who's willing to do all of that. Um, and they fill a nice role for sort of a mid-level artist like myself. Um, I, yes, publicist for record releases. Um, I learned how to do my own website about 10 years ago because I was tired of how long it took for someone to change a tour date for me. And that's where it started. I learned basic HTML to be able to do that and have grown along with that. I also think for me, the, the choice of webmaster as self is an artistic choice for me as well. Um, I feel the way that I build my website and the way it runs is an expression, in a lot of ways, an expression of who I am as an artist. And um, graphic designer for record releases and merch only. I, I do have one graphic designer that I've worked with for a long time for almost everything for the past 10 years. And that's another important relationship for me in terms of having something consistent in the way that I present what I do to the world. And um, that working relationship, the loyalty of it and the understanding of it is really important to me. Do you want to add in one more thing that you have? Your a la carte? Yes. Oh, OK, great. So also, we have all these, these roles. And some of them I'm filling myself, and some of them I, I can't. Um, I have started working with a company called By the Pound Media. BJ is here, um, and and BJ is his company is one of a kind of a, a, a number of companies, sort of a new breed of company that are sort of rising up to do basically with this a la carte artist services, right? So what I don't have time for, what I don't have a skill set for, I can sort of pick and choose from BJ's skill set and ask him to do certain things for me at certain times. And um, he works with a number of artists, and it's different for every artist, but it's a really affordable flexible solution for trying to solve these roles. Right. Thanks. Does anyone have questions so far like um, we uh, about the sort of setup of the roles and also even how Erin is currently organizing her life? <laughs> <laughs> life? All right. Well, that was sort of a long setup for just being able to show you some of the survey data about because we did ask on the survey, you know, like who your, who's on your team, and the list had about 18 different things on it. And you'll, as you'll see, there's a, quite a response. So just to give you a sense of the survey size, as we said, over 5,000 U.S.-based musicians and composers completed the survey, um, which was a wonderful response rate. Um, uh, genres, a lot of folks were in classical, but we had about 30 different genres represented. 40% um, of the respondents were basically spending their whole work week doing music. And for 42% of them, they earned all of their personal annual income from music. Well, there's a small strata at the lower level, but you know, it was, it was really nice to see um, such a high percentage of survey respondents making all their money from their craft. So how was the survey response structured? It was a widely distributed online survey. We had, in fact, Charlie was part of our effort to um, market it to as many musicians as possible. We used a variety of uh, ways. We reached out through professional organizations that had memberships. We reached out through informal networks, blogs, earned media. Um, what else? Media. Social media. It was, yeah. Yep. Uh, can you make any statement of 42% of what kind of people? Uh, I have to money through. Sure. I mean, we can we can cut the data in many ways and say like um, what the characteristics are of folks that are in the 42%. Yeah. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but um, yeah, we yeah sure we have we have a lot of different ways we can parse the data um, because we asked very specifically about you know how much time do you spend, what genres do you how educated are you? Um, so well, you'll see some of them, but we can actually fill in the gaps, too. Um, the average personal gross income for our survey respondents was about $55,000. Um, but we also are able to calculate how much money they made on music, because $55,000 might include stock returns and other jobs, because we just asked them, what's your personal gross income? This one. Um, was a calculation of their personal gross income multiplied by the percent of income they said they made from music. And so it was about 34000 which is slightly lower than the per capita income that the Bureau of Labor Statistics 
um, offers. But this is sort of just to give you a sense of the uh, respondents from the survey. They were a highly educated group. 80% um, had a college degree or greater. And in more, even more interesting, 61% had a music degree. That means they went to a conservatory or a music industry school. Um, so that's a really high number. Um, so we also asked them about, or we sort of tried to figure out what, how many roles they were playing. And I, maybe roles isn't the right word here. But this, this chart shows how much, how many, um, we asked them to allocate their, their money for a given year into eight buckets. They said, like, OK, this has to add up to 100%. How many buckets does, um, how much money would you put in the composition bucket, in the performance bucket, in the session work bucket, in the teaching bucket? And everyone you know, has their own mixture. But what this um, shows that, for the most part, more than half respondents are playing at least two roles. They're being a composer and a performer, or they're a composer and a teacher, or a teacher and a session mu musician. Um, so you can see that it's really difficult, or it's not difficult. It's, for our survey respondents, it's more likely they're playing more than one role. But for those 983 that are said, 100% of my money came from one role. So what, what are they doing? Um, most of them, well, the, the num largest number of them are making their money from live performance. So 100% of my money last year came from live performance. For 200 of them, 100% of their money came from being a salaried player. And other is a, is a category we had so many other revenue streams we had to ask about. So other could have been, maybe they made all their money from, um, from AFM Special Payments Fund. Like there's a lot of very specific revenue streams that um, are totally fine for certain types of artists to access. It's just that it was difficult to ask a general survey population about them. So, so that's just about the number of roles people are playing. So who are the team members of our survey respondents? We'll start with all 5371, the people, everybody responded. Um, as a note, we asked um, not just who's on your team, but what's the relationship? So um, one relationship is, is it a paid or contracted relationship? The second one is, is it an equity slash partnership relationship? Like, are you guys sort of, um, do you have some sort of relationship like that? The third is, is it volunteer pro bono? And the fourth is not applicable. And we made sure we asked not applicable for almost every question because we know that we can't make assumptions about whether this applies to most musicians or not. And you can make, it's clear that not applicable is an important data point. So we can talk about that too. But um, I think the interesting part about this chart is not sort of what's first and what's last, but the number of things on it. You know, there's, I think, about 17 or 18 potential team members. And it was also an open-ended question, so we had more at the bottom. You know, other people, I'm trying to remember some of the responses people gave us. Um, uh, merchandiser, there were some others that, were, that popped up that we hadn't thought of that were important to some people. Um, but, you know, interesting, the, the not applicable one, just to sort of tease that out a bit. I mean, think about why would a, an, a, I don't know, a booking agent not be applicable to somebody? Well, if you're an orchestra performer, you're not, you don't need a booking agent. Yeah? Are you saying that 80% or whatever affirmatively said not applicable as opposed to just leaving it blank? Yes, they said not applicable. So they don't have a booking agent. That's right. Whether they're paid, volunteer, whatever. That's right. Oh, yeah. 80% of the people said, I don't have a booking agent. But thinking about the folks who took this survey, you might be a, in an orchestra, and you don't need a booking agent. You might be a session player. You're not responsible for booking the shows. You might be a teacher. You might be a composer. You're not performing. So there's a lot of different reasons that not applicable is an important, uh, you know, an important measure. So just to keep in mind that the US music community is large and diverse and specialized, and there's some there's many instances where, um, where what, what is applicable varies, is very specific to the roles and the genres that people work in. So but let's look more at the team data. We're able to cut it. Like We have four different present, present presentations of it. Um, one of them is um, it's the same data. I just picked the top six to make it readable. And these are what we call full-time musicians. And for us, this, this definition is if the respondent survey respondent was making more than 90% of their money from music and spending more than 36 hours a week doing music, that's our definition of full-time musician. So the dark purple bars, the full-timers, 
are the full-timers, and the light purple bars are the not full-timers, the people who are spending less than 36 hours and uh, making less than 90% of their money. So the big differences that I see visually are the full-time musicians are more likely to have an accountant and an attorney, um, a paid accountant and a paid attorney. So that might be a sort of a chicken and egg thing, like perhaps you're a full-time musician, um, well, chicken and egg, you might, because you're a full-time musician, you might need an accountant and attorney versus the other version, which I can't even articulate. <laughs> um, do, you, do you make more money because you have an attorney, exactly. or do you need an attorney because you're making more money? money. That's right. Um, and I don't know what the answer is to that <laughs> from this stuff. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of our survey respondents were highly educated, and Interestingly, the musicians with a music degree, which is the dark blue, or the sort of normal blue bar, um, are, well, let's say the greenish bar is not people who didn't have a music degree, and they're more likely to rely on partnerships and equity stakes and volunteers and bandmates for sure. So um, there's just a, an interesting difference there about the difference between the folks who have conservatory degrees and who don't. I think that the conservatory folks are um, in roles that where they perhaps don't need a whole lot of team members. Um, I think there's sort of prerequisites for um, some folks to, you know, if you have a conservatory degree, or no, let's just say it this way, to be a sort of professional orchestra player, you most almost always have to have a conservatory degree. So I think there's some people who end up in that role. So the conservatory degree apply, uh, implies that they might be doing some of these things that don't need a whole lot of team. Yeah, or or yeah, or the people that are con have conservatory degrees. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of people are conservatory, but they're jazz too. So, um, yeah, high earners. These are people who are making a hundred thousand dollars or more from music uh, that answered the survey. So for them, I think the distinction's really clear. They're twice as likely to have a paid accountant, a, an attorney, a webmaster, a booking agent and more, much more like a graphic designer. So you can see it's, again, chicken and egg. Do they have these people working for them because they're making money? Or are they making money because these people are working for them? And it's, it's hard to tease it out beyond this. But um, from what Erin was saying from her role, her sort of current team data, it's, some of this stuff becomes essential, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, what I would say about that, that chicken and egg question that's sort of coming up about these roles is that what I see is that for musicians and sort of my, my point is like we do as much as we can till we like are over capacity and then we do some more and then we ask someone to help. And that, that seems to me to be the sort of the sort of path towards getting these roles. But I, I agree with Kristen. I would like to I would like to find some way to tease out that, that relationship and it comes back to me, it comes back to this funding piece, which is like you know, where do you get the money to invest in an attorney if you're not making enough money to have one? Mm -hmm. Is it mostly economic consideration that makes you push yourself to do roles that you don't feel comfortable with? Or think For me, it's mostly economic mm -hmm. consideration. I mean, some of it is creative, as I was mentioning in some of those other roles. Like, I might choose to have salaried band members for a different creative choice. But for most, for me, mostly it's the economic consideration. Mm -hmm. It seems to me like any band starts up, they start off with Yeah, well, I think it's true-ish, but if, as long as we don't remember that there's there's a lot of folks beyond the sort of indie rock band, right. Men, right. you know, yeah. framework. But also, I mean, since you've been at this more than ten years, right, things change too. Right. I mean, yeah, when I started out, I, I actually had more team members than I do now. At different times in my career, I have had different business structures. I guess what I was thinking is like before you, you can get like in the old school music thing. You, get interest from a label, you wanted to be able to demonstrate that you could sell uh, records and do all that stuff. So you had to build a fan base in the first place, so you had to start the business in the first place. So that's my understanding of it. Well, maybe not for the Jackson 5, though. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, like there's, a, there's a, that other piece of it where someone sees, like, a potential that is, hasn't been realized yet and is able to use these roles to help fulfill that potential. Mm. Should we let's yeah. grab Go ahead. Oliver? You, you were saying that at least one of the principal limiting factors is, is time, just as you say, you do as much as you can, then you try more, and then you, you find help. 
<laughs> is there also um, the, the two other categories that occur to me, and I'd be interested in hearing your, your notion of what how much of it is there, is one is expertise. I mean, the, the obviously the accountants and lawyers and that sort of thing, at least, at least purport to have, have additional expertise that mm -hmm. may be hard to come to. And uh, secondly, uh, how much of it is connections? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, again, the, the, one of the roles of an intermediary in this is, is that they're full-time building connections rather than, than full-time doing, doing creative stuff. So I'm wondering whether you know how much of those two uh, play into your, your need to, to, to Yeah, expand. I would say they're both really big limiting factors. So we have a fun slide later about expertise in terms of like what you need to know how to do that we'll, yeah. that we'll get to. In fact, in fact, it's right here, um, which is we, have, we can, we have these other sort of definitions we've made about expertise. Um, our old guard people are people who have 20 years of experience or more in the music industry and spend all their time and make all their money doing this. But we also have a middle ground, the established people they are also spending all their time doing music, but they have six to 20 years of experience. And then the emerging artists are making all their money doing this, but they've only had five years of experience. And so it's funny, the old guard folks need, um, the old folks need um, accounting and branding help and web presence help, but the emerging artists need a booking agent and a sound person. Like they're sort of out, out there engaging, trying to get um, shows. I think the sound person sort of a. I think some thought. of that also reflects. Um, the limits of our bodies mm -hmm. there's like there's as you become an older musician like you really literally cannot I mean if you have a if you have a large team team members you know we see people in their 70s who are road dogs all the time but they have an enormous support staff um, so I think that also is reflected in that because as you get older if you do not have the support staff you do need to find other ways to make money that are not about dragging yourself around the country in a van mm -hmm. and there's also I mean the thing about web presence and stuff, I think they're the, some of the younger artists are probably just accustomed to mm -hmm. figuring out Facebook or tweeting or Tumblr. Like, you just grow up with it. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. So um, the last three slides of this run are sort of about what is the how do team members impact earning capacity? So um, just to sort of un explain this slide. We asked all, remember we asked all the respondents to allocate their money amongst different buckets. And so how much of your money came in the last 12 months came from licensing your compositions? And for the entire survey population, it was 6% of their money came from compositions. But if we ask the people who have a publisher, wow, they make three times as much money on compositions than the person who doesn't have a publisher. Um, the same goes, there's, there's just higher percentages of income from compositions if you have an attorney or a label or an accountant. Again, chicken and egg, we're not sure, but I think the publisher um, role does make a difference in how much money people make from compositions if that's a part, a part of their revenue stream. Um, we, had, we also asked about the income from sound recordings, so the recorded music side. For our general survey population, it was about 6% of their money came from sound recordings. But if you have a label, that's more than double, 13%. And if you have a webmaster, that's 13% too. But Aaron and I were talking about this too. Like, yes, you can, if you have a good solid webmaster web strategy, you can do a lot with sound recordings, selling them online and having a, a top spin account or having a band camp page. There's a lot of stuff you can do to make money on sound recordings, right? They, is there control in this? I mean, can the label and the webmaster categories of musicians, are they overlapping? Yes, they are overlapping. Yeah, okay. We can take a, we can separate them out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. But we did ask, have people, you can, as many, answer, you, you could only answer one item per line, but you could have as many team members as you said, as you wanted to. So you can like calculate ROI for those buckets? Yes, I have them all. Yeah. And finally, income from live performance, not as drastic or dramatic for all of our respondents. It was about 28% of their income, which is the biggest pie slice, by the way. Um, but if you have a booking agent, that number goes up a lot. That makes sense, right? Yes? Uh, well, we didn't ask on this team question, but we have different data about what's your label relationship. Uh, we didn't, but I didn't calculate it for this. Part. Yeah, but we did ask, what's your label relationship? Separately. Is that later? Not here. Um, yeah, it's sort of a different uh, bucket. <laughs> Sorry, it's a big survey. Um, right, so live performance, not as drastic, but a, sound, a booking agent makes a difference. Um, 
Can I say something quick though? Yeah. Um, so that number 28% or even 43%, um, I think there's again like this quit this thought about sort of the new music world, like it's okay if people don't buy records. People make most of their money from playing. 43 is not most of your money. It's a piece of the pie. It's the largest, the largest of the pieces, but it is not this sort of like, don't worry about it, size piece. <laughs> it's also important that for many artists that they don't, they don't perform. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you, you, there's no one size fits all solution here. There's yeah. artists that just don't perform. So we can't forget about them. Um, so this is a funny slide just to, um, this is your new job description. Um, and it's too bad that you can't see at this bottom it says, and all you wanted was some sex. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, there's all sorts of technologies and services out there that can facilitate artists doing it themselves, but this might be the list of things that you end up doing. Um, just a couple of takeaways. So, you know, it's, I think it's fair to say technologies have empowered music creators in many ways, but they've created efficiencies, they've made it possible for artists to break through barriers uh, into the marketplace, but it creates new work. There's a lot of new things people and artists are doing now. Um, musicians um, need and benefit from various teammates, depending on the roles they play and the genres they work in, but the dynamics and the relationships are changing. And I think Aaron is a, a, a case study in this, and how things have changed drastically for you over the past 10 to 12 years. Um, and, you know, today's we, don't, we just focus on this team data for today, but we have a lot of other data on our website. We have these case studies that look at the specific um, incomes, in, uh, income and expenses for um, a handful of different musicians. And then we've had, we've already released about eight or 10 different data points, and then we have some more coming up. But yeah, I mean, this if people have questions about the work or about the team data or thoughts about this, especially, and I know that Aaron, you wanted to talk about funding, because I, that dynamic has changed drastically. Yeah, I mean, that's my, that's sort of my, uh, well, a couple, a couple things. I mean, first of all, thank you. Um, I've, I've, one thing I thought, um, looking through this, and I've seen it before, and we've talked about it a lot, but one thing I, um, was interested in is sort of the digital divide where it comes up in this survey because the most of the survey data is from an online hmm? survey. Um, but you know, it, it's great that you guys also have these sort of non offline these offline experiences of talking to musicians. So I just wanted to like put that out on the floor, like especially when we got to the sort of who are the people in this survey. And so I think that's mm -hmm. an important part to remember is what you know what there's playing musicians that do not have as much access to the online world and their concerns are something I think we should also be thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, so to come back to this funny thing, which I think, think through the course of the presentation, I, I may have said a lot of the things that I was thinking of saying about it, but it seems to me um, one of the biggest questions because what what happens is, I think for, for most musicians, and I'd love to see this compared to other types of businesses, but like we, we don't have a margin. Like there's nothing really. like. You, you really, it's very tight. It's very, very tight. Even if you are doing it really well and being really smart about it and being really conservative, there's still not a lot of extra money floating around. And with the, the piece of, as Kristen was saying, there's some of these sort of advances that come from labels or publishers are drying up and it's leaving this sort of big hole for us to find out where is that capital gonna come from? And I'm glad that you mentioned credit cards. So many people, that is their solution. That is the only solution. It's really hard to get any other kind of loan for being a musician. So credit cards, and we all know like terrible rates of credit cards and that what an awful cycle that is. But it's kind of the only thing available in some ways. But some other things are starting up. You can ask your family, but then look at who that excludes, right? A lot of folks that don't come from families with wealth. And so are they able to be artists? And should that be a limiting factor to who gets to participate in these systems? Um, we have things like what Jace, what Jace here does, a pledge music. Um, there's other platforms that do similar things that are arising to try to fill this. And then um, sponsorship, Kristen mentioned, which mm -hmm. I hadn't even thought about. There's a lot of bands that are, um, I, the first one that comes off the top of my head is OK Go. They're a band that has gotten 
um, sponsorship from non-musical companies for their sort of videos that they do. They had a video on the Super Bowl that came from Ford, mm -hmm. paid for it. They also did a State Farm sponsored commercial. They also did a Land Rover one, I think. Um, they, they've sort of filled that gap that comes up with um, money from other places. Now, they say that, that that money has come with very few strings, which is great. I don't know that that's always the case. But those are sort of my things to, to push onto the floor, but Chris. Well, great presentation. And, and I guess I was thinking about the do-it-yourself piece of it. We're in the shadow of Harvard Law School. When people here who are lawyers or you know familiar with legal uh, problems hear somebody doing a lot of it on their own, does it uh, make people worry? Uh, do you worry that you know five years from now, if you want to reissue material, you may not have the contracts in in the right uh, uh, order? Everything might not be all buttoned down. If you want to license something, do you have all the rights? There are copyright questions. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it seems to me there's a there's an exposure here. I can understand the necessity for, for having to do it on your own, but does it worry people in the room that uh, the artists are exposing themselves to, to a lot of potential problems? Yep. Well, the, the highway is littered with people who signed that deal. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm trying to think. <clears throat> Everyone, this is Walter McDonough, so music lawyer and on the, also on the board of Future Music Coalition. Mm -hmm. um, you two, like, when, I mean, the, the classic story is you two signed, like, the worst deal of all time. And um, when they hit critical mass, they, were, they, they had the leverage to renegotiate it. But I, I worked for a pretty prominent lawyer in the business, and I said, you know, what are you going to do with these people who signed bad deals? And said, the only thing they can do is become very successful because they have the leverage to renegotiate. But unfortunately, for people, I'm working with a band right now. It's a very prominent Midwest punk band that has a brutal deal. But they're not at the level where they can command the leverage. So it's that's you're absolutely correct. And I mean, people cheat themselves out of the future by signing bad deals, without any legal representation. Yeah, and it, on a, even on a more basic level, um, in the 1990s, I ran an, an independent record label. We put out our own records, but we also put out records for bands we liked. And so we had about 75 releases in eight years. Um, the thing that I wish we had had at that point was just a basic band agreement. So how much does, what percentage does each person get in the band? And who do I send the money to? I mean, it's really basic. But for now, 15 years later, I have still have trouble figuring out who gets the money, that we get these sort of small payments from iTunes and stuff from the catalog being available. There's like just basic sort of historical arcs on some of this stuff that have to do with contracts and very basic legal agreements that I wish we had. <laughs> and it's hard, because we were totally DIY. And I, I think the thing that we didn't want to do was create a mistrust. Like, why would we be asking them to sign a contract? We were in Washington, DC, in the shadow, not of Harvard, but of Discord Records. Yeah. Um, and that was, they were our <coughs> flagship label, and we wanted to act like Discord, um, which never signs contracts. So, but it, it's not because we want to rip bands off, but now I wish we did, just because I wish I had some instructions. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I've also uh, have been a, um, um, an entertainment lawyer in, in the and in the music business a bit, and uh, I would say that your question is has got many different layers in it. For instance, there are some very good form books out there. The 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 classic this this business of music is out there. It's got a whole set of forms in the back. They may not be the most up to date things going, but but if you educate yourself about it. The, certainly, the dealings within and around the band, and the, you know, getting rights and, at that kind of level, is something you probably can manage on on your own. Would be my expectation, and you better because because uh, at least starting out, you're not likely to be able to afford more more high price. But I think you're hearing also though that when you're dealing with other professionals in the industry, like the record companies, the publishing companies, that's where uh, there are frequently some of the landmines that are just hidden there. And, and as you say, you can sign yourself away for, 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 for a, a, bad, a bad recording deal that suddenly you're stuck with for the next 10 years unless you can get very famous and renegotiate. So, so there, there are different spots uh, for this. And uh, my own recommendation would be, you know, it, you can, if you take the time to self-educate, be reasonably good at, at the kind of entry level stuff. What you don't want to do is to sign anything that's multiple years or, 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 or that kind of thing without, without an, an experienced guide into it, because that, that, that you can get in trouble. Yeah, I think that, and I also think it speaks to 
I, I mean, something that comes up for me looking at all this stuff, and especially the slide about and all you wanted was sex, like that list of things, you know, it. I do marvel at, over the years I've been doing this, how I've become like semi-expert in a number of different things. Like I can talk to you about different types of paper and four color printing processes because I've printed 10 CDs in my lifetime. Or I can talk to you about how to make a great t-shirt and how many screens you need and let's price it out. You know what I mean? Like, And I, I actually think that that's really valuable. And I think for every artist, there's probably like a tipping point that's very personal in terms of how much of that you want to know. Um, but I would encourage all artists to please try to know something. Um, and again, that goes back to this other piece that I mentioned before, this sort of this trope that like the artist is this idiot that can't fry an egg. But I, I mean, I feel like if you can play the saxophone at a world-class level, you can understand basic contract law. I, I would add just in addition to contract, that certainly for the composers and the songwriters, like the intellectual property component is critical. Um, and um, I know it's about revenue, but did you ask if they were having fun? We asked about time allocation. A really interesting question was, um, if, if money was not an issue, what would you be doing more of? And the top answer was, I'd be spending more time in the studio recording. <laughs> and the one at the very bottom, fundraising. Yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. Yeah. But uh, we, we should, we'll have to post the time allocation stuff soon, um, maybe, maybe this week. It's really interesting, just as like an interesting now stuff. Now you've done it, is there a question you wish you would have asked that you didn't? <coughs> Uh, uh, you know, I don't know yet. I, I'm still kind of wading through all the data to figure out what we've learned, so I don't know yet. I saw Harris yeah, for a second, yeah, and right. then we'll do Matt after okay. that. Yeah, I really appreciate the methodology of this presentation that you segmented a uh, different source of revenues that uh, in terms of this field musician that people make. And I'm wondering, uh, in, during your process of research, have you ever found that maybe certain type of people might uh, earn much more money than you expected, and why is that? Or a certain kind of people make less money than you expected, and why is that? Hmm. Yeah, um, it, it mostly came up in the interviews, um, and it, it's sort of it's it's hard to quantify, but when we were when we were doing interviews, we used um, a snowball sample method. So we had sort of individual we had individuals that we started with. So it, we wanted to find a musician type. Like we want to talk to a Nashville songwriter, and we would find one, and then we'd use a snowball sample to find that we'd ask that person for peer referrals. And so as we moved beyond our sort of initial t list of in of interested pe interesting people, we started knowing fewer and fewer. Like way fewer people and it was fascinating to talk to some artists who I'd never heard of before who were doing totally fine making a full-time career at music who I'd never heard of before but also were making quite a bit of money and um, the things that surprised me I was talking to a, a platinum rock band who I knew by name but didn't know personally but I was surprised at how much money came from sponsorships mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just straight up tour guarantees um, but that's all, it, it's interesting when you when you talk to people, you can also sort of tease out a bit the income versus expenses side because for the most part, it's, it's you can ask about gross income, the inputs, but it's difficult to ask about the expense side just because it varies so much. We did on the survey ask, um, ask people to sort of, hey, what's gotten more expensive on the touring side, like gas, travel, session players, um, staff. But it was hard to ask about expenses on other stuff because Oftentimes, artists aren't paying for them, or it's just too variable. And you also have this whole revenue picture where it's like, you might make, um, there's this term we, we came up, we were talking about this morning that I don't know if you guys know or not, but it's something called mailbox money. Mm -hmm. And it's basically like every artist's dream, right? It's the money that just shows up for something that you didn't have to put effort into. So that's like royalties or a sync license, um, that kind of thing. And, and so that money, you might have another bucket that is like so far in the red that your mailbox money covers that bucket. So like it becomes this like bigger piece in terms of like where any any margin or profit is coming from. Mm -hmm. Yep. We had Matt after. And if you look at the case studies, it makes it very it's very clear like a, a jazz the jazz band leader is making a, quite a bit of money from live performance, but the more they make with live performance, the greater the expenses get. It's very clear that yep. it's hard to make like sort of use uh, effic efficiencies. Right. <laughs> the touring just costs money. Yep. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, 
another question about sort of the quality and maybe the kind of the, the fun of the life. Um, and maybe it's a bit of a chicken and egg question as well. But the the musical community, how how does that do? You, do you see in these data any any way of of coming to grips with how the technological engagement changes the way in which you know you find musicians to play uh, to tour with or or to play sessions with? I mean, is that still does that still is it kind of a survival of the word of mouth of gigging musicians, or you know, when it comes to putting a street team together or doing merchandising? What's are people is the technology having an impact across the board from like session musicians and orchestra members to independent musicians, or is there a lot of variability in the, in the ways in which people are using these tools to just build their communities? Well, we did ask people like, "How are you using technology?" And the things that um, they say it helps them engage with fans, and also it helps them collaborate with others. Yeah. So, um, I was actually a little surprised that collaborate with others was as high as it was on the list. Um, it wasn't just about the pure sort of economic. Hey, I'm selling music, or I'm you know I've got a zillion Twitter friends. It's like I can collaborate, and um, so technology has a sort of a, a more meta. Um, effect as well. It came up in the interviews too. Like people talked about it's democratizing power, you know? And so it was more than just, hey, I can get my stuff up on iTunes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I would second that and say, especially the first thing that came up when you were asking your question was, um, uh, this new record that I've made has, um, it's got like 16 people on it and it was made at nine different studios. And um, I wasn't there for a lot of it, you know what I mean? I did a lot of like sending someone an MP3, having them sing along to it, and having them send me back the full, the full high quality files. Um, and that, you know, then you also like, not to get into another set of weeds, but you've got these like, I use like services that allow me to move big files across the internet. Um, and it's made it in completely possible for me to have this friend who was on the road, I needed her to sing on the record, so she stopped at my friend's place in Nashville and did this thing on a Sunday morning. And then later that day, my friend in Oakland, also doing the same song, was able to do it. So technology is like big time for that in terms of collaboration. The other thing I'll say about the street team, you mentioned street team. Um, I find that interaction, the last time I really tried it, which was probably about four or five years ago, to be like pretty unreliable. Like, well, I'm going to balance that with another story, but at one point, you know, you could email me and say, I want to help with merch for the show, or I want to put posters up. And I would say, like, three out of five people never showed up or didn't do what they said they were going to do. Now, the other hand, I used um, social networks to crowdsource choruses for a tour that I did in December. This was what Kristen was talking about at the beginning. I did an anti-holiday tour, and I had cranky carolers, and they were crowdsourced from Twitter and Facebook. I just, a couple weeks beforehand, said, like, okay, I'm coming to Philly, and if you're willing to wear a bad holiday sweater, I'm going to give you a copy of the album and um, a handmade hymnal, and love for you to come on stage and sing. And um, it was an incredible experience, actually. I met some really fantastic people and had very, very few dropouts. Basically, everyone who said they would come came. And I think the night you did it, there was maybe, like, 15 people in the chorus. Um, most cities had between, like, 10 and 15 people. So that's an opposite story to that. This um, it's it, it's we're at twelve forty right now. So, um, we'll do this question and then and then we have one more back here. And too. then we got one more. Okay, okay. perfect. That's really fast. All right. Okay. But it's probably moved. <laughs> By any chance, did you ask people if they were happy? We didn't ask um, sort of a satisfaction. We just asked about time allocation. That's yeah. So we don't know whether making more money or less money or independent labor or all that. What no. effect on satisfaction? No, didn't. Sorry. That's a good, that's a great point, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Too focused on the money aspect. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what is happy? Yeah. Does he do? So my question is about, um, and you kind of touched on it talking about the recording of your latest CD. But what is the role of recording studios mm -hmm. in the ecosystem? Um, you know, how much does it cost to access recording studios? What does that mean in terms of the team? Mm -hmm. um, but also, what does that mean um, for both kind of online and offline distribution modes? Um, you had mentioned before, Aaron, that online distribution is not the case as a panacea. It's, it's not um, a really high impact revenue. So I sense 
sensing that in the contemporary scene, there's a lot of interest in offline distribution, in DIY, you know, innovative forms. And so does that, uh, is that a response to the online you know, mode? Mm -hmm. And then also, how does that impact how things get recorded? Mm -hmm. Great point. I mean, do you have more experience with the well, recording? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll say I'll say a couple things. Um, um, some some online stuff works really great and gets and you get paid well for, and some you don't. And and I think there is an important distinction in terms of that. Like certainly, there's some services that pay well and some that don't. And and you can't make a generalization to say that it it um, that it is totally great because if everyone know everyone knows the sort of like Spotify problem which is that they basically don't pay. And um, on, on the, the fan side, fan facing side of that is, oh, this is an amazing service. And on the musician side, it's, it's more complicated. But I, I think um, your question about the, how does the online and the offline interact in that way, um, I certainly think that there's a sort of offline like response like sort of blooming. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is the sort of we hear about the resurgence of vinyl, mm -hmm. sort of like way that people are talking about a physical object that they want to experience from a performer, mm -hmm. and vinyl is a, a nice one that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then about the recording studios, I would say it's similar to um, it's similar to what we've seen in these other businesses that are part of this, right? It 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 um, you can do it yourself. There are some trade offs. And um, some of the larger ones still, some r large recording studios still survive, and there's certain things that can be done there that can't be done in other places. And you sort of have to, you have this range of options, but you, you make a decision based on maybe your creative needs or your economic situation. Mm -hmm. I can speak a little bit to that relationship mm -hmm. and how recording studios e are evolving in the sense of getting involved in um, helping artists with revenue streams that they might not have had before with the relationship that we're developing kind of in the backyard here in, S in Somerville with Q Division is that um, particular engineers or studio managers um, obviously have projects that they're concerned about getting paid for but they also love from a creative standpoint and they're getting involved uh, uh, to the extent of helping create additional content um, and, and providing services for crowdsourced campaigns or direct -to fan campaigns that can enrich the experience for the fan and still um, deliver more money to the artists themselves, which obviously means they get paid. Everybody, thanks once again to Chris and Thompson. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, this talk is going to be archived if you want to go back and you have more questions. Kristen and I are easily found. And uh, money.futureofmusic.org. So thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Nice job.